Good morning, Meeting House. I'm Meredith Dancos. I'm the teaching pastor here. Welcome, Dillsburg. Welcome those who are viewing online. Hey, if you want to let us know where you're watching from, we would love to engage with you and say hello. And we are finishing up, or we're actually continuing our series of your best year ever. And today we're talking about how to upgrade your family. And I just want to say from the front end right here, some of you are like, we're talking about parenting. I'm not a parent. There is something for everyone today. So whether you're a parent or not, there's something for you today. But parents in particular, and I I love working with parents. It's one of my great privileges as a pastor and running a parenting ministry here at the Meeting House. Uh, You know that parenting is one of the hardest jobs that we can have, right? Like you get this little person and now you're supposed to steer them to both be a contributing member of society and eventually move out of your house. You can figure out which one you prioritize there, you know. So some of you are like, just get out of my house at some point. So uh, especially if you have toddlers because you think, man, no one tells you how mean toddlers can be, right? Anyways, uh, but parenting, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's hard. And parents, we want what's best for our kids. And we want to steer them in the right direction because we feel responsible for them. And sometimes what we think the message that we're trying to get through isn't always getting through. Sometimes there's a different message that gets through. Even though we're trying to help them you know, make good decisions and figure out the best way to go. And Harvard did a study a number of years ago, and they, they surveyed over 10,000 students in 33 different school districts, and they asked them to rank different values. And overwhelmingly, over 80% of students said that they believe this to be true. My parents are prouder if I get good grades in my classes than if I'm a caring community member. They, over 80% said that achievement is more important than, than caring for other people. That that's what parents value most and that that's what their peers also valued most. And here's the thing about what we value, what we think is the most important, it's what we spend our time going after. So if we play that out, what that means is our kids are spending more time thinking about and spending time trying to accomplish getting a, an A in their class, being the best person on their sports team, being the most popular kid in class, getting awards and accolades than they are on how to care for other people. And as parents, none of us would say, yes, that's what we care more about. We want you to get an A more than being a kind, compassionate person. But that's the message that's overwhelmingly getting through to our children. And it's not just stopping with our children. In fact, it's going into us as parents. There's a new trend that's called, we've moved from parenting to sharenting. And sharenting, this is the official definition of sharenting. The habitual use of social media to share news, images, etc., of one's children. Right? And so sharenton, you might have moved from being a parent to a sharent if you are regularly exercising the humble brag when you are posting things about your children. Like, you know, no big deal. My kid's potty trained at one. Gotcha. You know? And we start to think like, oh, I'm, I start to find my identity as a parent, and how my child is measuring up against their peers. And there's nothing wrong with being proud of our kids, right? Or if they do something exciting or they, like there's nothing wrong with sharing things about our kids, but it's when it becomes a competition. And parenting, this this spirit of competition has worked its way in where we start to think, ah, I'm only as good as my kid is. And we start to live vicariously through our kids' accomplishments. And this emphasis on achievement and accomplishment, it's taking its effect on people. Both kids and parents alike. We're seeing a rise, in, a rise in depression. We're seeing a rise in anxiety disorders. There's this constant nagging fear of I'm never good enough. I'm not going to measure up. Something's going to go wrong at some point. Because achievement is always about someone else rewarding you, about you getting it right, about you being the best. And we have to wonder, how did we get here? How did we get here where our kids think that we value grades over being kind And that as parents, we're starting to compete with each other over what our children do in comparison to their peers. And working with parents, I hear the same common fears over and over again. And they are, I don't, I don't want to be someone who stands in the way of my kid accomplishing whatever they want, right? I don't, I don't want to somehow mess them up and they didn't do something right and now they didn't live up to their full potential. I don't want to hold them back. And more often than not, I hear parents say, I want to give my kids the things that I didn't have. I want their life to be better than my life. I want them to be better off than I am, right? And so maybe I didn't get the opportunity to play sports, and so I signed my kid up for every sport they want to. Or maybe my parents weren't around enough, so now I've decided to be involved in every single aspect of their life all the time, 
right? And, and what we see with that is while the, it seems like the intention is good behind that, really it's a parenting out of scarcity. It's a parenting out of lack. It's a parenting out of fear that they're going to miss out on something. I missed out on something, and they're going to miss out on something. But when we're parenting out of fear, when we're we're parenting out of scarcity, that's when these wrong messages can start to get through. Because if you don't get it right, you're going to miss out. If you don't get get the highest grade, then you might not get into the school, and then you might not be able to do this, and and we start to play it all out. But Jesus gives us a different picture. Rather than parenting out of scarcity and out of lack, and out of fear, Jesus invites us to think about parenting out of abundance, out of not, not starting from what we didn't have and trying to give that to our kids, but instead oh, giving them from what we have in abundance, what is overflowing in our lives. And so if you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 7. Some context here. This is, Matthew was a follower of Jesus, and he wrote down his account of what it was like to follow after Jesus, what he experienced, what he saw, what Jesus said. And so this this passage is part of what's known as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is up on a mountainside, and he's got this huge crowd of people, and he's talking to them. He's teaching them the, the basics of prayer and forgiveness and what it means to follow after God. And he poses these two rhetorical questions to the crowd. And he says this, You parents, if your children ask for a loaf of bread... Do you give them a stone instead? Or if they ask for a fish, do you give them a snake? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask him? So let's break that down a little bit. So Jesus poses these two questions and gives the obvious answer, right? Like if your child comes to you and asks for bread, who's going to give them a stone? And the way that the loaves were baked back then, they would look like a stone. So it would be like this really mean, practical joke. Like, sure, you can have some bread, and then they break their tooth, right? Like that's not, you, parents would be like, that's not a good idea. I wouldn't do that, right? Or if they ask you for a fish, you give them a snake. And either way, if the snake is alive, that's dangerous. If the snake is dead, that's gross, right? There's, there's just nothing, there's no good there, right? And so the obvious answer, which Jesus says is, of course not. No, like none of you are going to do that. That's not something that you should do. And you know that. So then he goes on to say, if you who are sinful, and that word there in Greek, right, often, sometimes it's translated, you who are evil, which sounds really like, oh, Jesus thinks I'm evil? But that word there is not in Greek. It doesn't mean malicious. Right? It doesn't mean you who are out to get people and harm people. What that word in Greek means is you who are, are oppressed by toil, who are burdened, who are morally diseased, who are pain-ridden, who are malignant, you who are in a bad state. You are, there is something wrong inside. Your impulses are not always right. If you who are in a bad state know how to give good gifts to your kids, Right? If you who are not perfect, then he says, how much more? And he creates this huge comparison. Sometimes we, we can't really see that when we read it in English, but it's like, how very, 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 very much more? Like, it's another obvious, right? If this is obvious that you're not going to give your kid a snake when they ask for a snack, right? How very much more obvious is it that your heavenly father, you, know, you who, there's something not right. You're not in the right state. You know how to give good gifts. So So your Heavenly Father who is perfect, your Heavenly Father who is all good, who is holy, how much more, how much greater is he able to give good gifts to those who ask? And that word ask is an important word because it is not just to ask someone, you know, a friend or a spouse. It is to be, it is one who is in a lower position to ask one who is in a greater position. Just like a child who is in a lower position. Children have less rights, they have less power, less capability, right, than, than one who is in a higher position. The other night, my daughter had a, had a really bad nightmare. This gives you a good example. She had a really bad nightmare. She was in a car, and then my husband, Steve, disappeared in the car, and then she was somewhere else, and she's like, and I, I couldn't drive. I can't drive a car, and I was just left there, right? Kids can't drive cars. You can, right? You're in, you have more skills and abilities and power than children do. That's the image that Jesus is giving. One who is in the position of a child asking one who, is, who has much greater power, right? So we are the child asking the one with greater power. Those who ask this heavenly Father, how much more will he give good gifts 
And the good gifts, that word, that good, is agathos in Greek. And it's often compared, it's, it's paired with that word that we say is, is sinful in, in the Greek as well. Because it, the, the comparison is one that is not beneficial to one that is beneficial. One that is not whole to one that is perfect and whole. So that agathos, it means that which is useful, beneficial, pleasant, joyful. Good gifts doesn't mean, because people ask, they, they bring this passage to me sometimes, and they're like, well, you know, I asked God for a raise and I didn't get it. Like, what, what are the good gifts? Good gifts aren't like swimming pools in your backyard or new sports cars or a brand new house. That's not what he's talking about there. He's saying that which is beneficial, that which is joyful and pleasant to your soul, that which is going to help you thrive in life. How much more, if you who love your kids, those of you who are parents in here, think about how much you love your kids, how much you want good things for your kids, and Jesus is saying, you, your impulses, they're, they're contaminated, right? You're not perfect. So God who's perfect, how much more is he going to give that which is good and beneficial and pleasing to you? So the question for us then is, what, what is beneficial? What are those gifts? And we should be asking. See, I have a friend who, he read this passage, and he started to pray, and it really challenged me. Because Jesus is giving this picture of this absolute trust in God. And he started praying, God, I want every good gift that you want to give me. And I thought, ooh, it feels so presumptuous to be like, I want good gifts. Right? But I was like, well, why wouldn't I pray for that? That's what Jesus tells us, that God is going to give you good gifts if you pray for them. So what are the good gifts that actually help us thrive as human beings? What is beneficial to us? And Daniel Siegel is someone that I really, I love. He's very wise. Uh, and he has done a lot. He's an interperson ner- interpersonal neurobiologist, and so he does a lot of, like, how does our brain impact our relationships and all of that. He's, he's very wise, and he, he released a book recently, and he talked about the four things that every human being needs. This is like, whether you're a parent or not, all, every human being needs these four things in order to thrive in life, and none of them is a corner office or a great car or an awesome body or the most friends on social media. None of it, it's none of that, right? The four things that every human being needs to thrive are these. Balance, resilience, insight, and empathy. Balance, resilience, insight, and empathy. These are the four things that we all need in order to thrive in life. And what I want to share today is actually when we, when we look at Jesus and we look at what it means to follow Jesus, he actually shows how following Jesus, how following after him and believing in him and letting him be Lord of our life, we receive these gifts first. And when we receive these gifts from God, we are then able to give them to our children. It is then we can parent out of abundance. So I want to break down each of these and show how God gives these to us and how we can receive these first. And then what it looks like to live those out with our kids. So the first one is balance. And balance is the starting place. And this is how Daniel Siegel defines balance. He says, balance is crucial for every aspect of your child's functioning. When a child is out of balance and out of control, whatever the cause, the reactive behavior can make things stressful and difficult for everyone, especially the child himself. We have a saying in Gracious Parenting, that's our parenting ministry here at the Meeting House, that everyone does better when they feel better. Right? When you're stressed out or worried or anxious or upset or hurt, you are not making your best decisions. Right? You, you as just a grown-up, when, when you are totally anxious about a meeting that you're going to have, you're, that's often when you're snappy or you're short with someone or you run a red light because you weren't paying attention. So when we are out of sorts, life doesn't go well for us. And so balance is the first place to start. And many of you don't know this because you haven't actually received this in your life, but that is the starting place for our relationship with God. God offers us a place of peace and balance in our lives, to to take what is out of sorts, what is not working, and help it to come back into order. Jesus says it like this. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. See, the first gift God gives us is balance. What Jesus doesn't say is, stop being anxious, 
get yourself in order, come to me with three solutions, you know, figure it out, and then when you're, when you're all calm and ready to go, then we can be in relationship. He says, bring to me whatever it is that has knocked your life out of balance. Bring to me whatever it is that is bothering you, that is weighing you down, and I will give you peace, and I will teach you rest. I will show you the way. Jesus offers us a place of peace first and foremost. That is the, that's the gift of being in relationship with Jesus. If you have not received that gift of balance, that's, a, that's the starting place, a place where we are loved and accepted and welcomed and wanted when we don't have it all together. And it's when we receive that first, when we know that I am loved and accepted, even when my life is out of balance and I can go here and I have a person who is for me and who loves me, that's when we can start to be that for our children. When we can be a person of peace for our kids, that we don't need them to have it all together when they come to us. That when they're hurt and their feelings are hurt or a friend has hurt them or they're worried or they're anxious or they made a bad decision, we are the safe place that they come. And we talk about in Gracious Parenting, this is connect before you correct. Be in relationship first. Let the message of love get through first. You know, there might be a conversation that needs to happen and things that need to be done on the other end, but first, we are placed to help that child restore balance. They don't have to get it together and then come and be in relationship with us because we have someone who's done that for us first. And so the gift of balance means we're people of peace. And when, our, when we are balanced, we can navigate the world better. We can make better decisions. And so when we get that gift from Jesus, that overflows into our kid's life. The second gift, the second gift is resilience. And we would say balance is the short-term goal. Right, balance helps us get calm and see things clearly and make better decisions. That's a short-term goal. Resilience is the long-term goal. Resilience is perseverance in the face of troubles. This is how Daniel Siegel defines resilience. Being resourceful and approaching life's challenges and moving through them with strength and clarity. Another word for this is grit. You know, that kids can hang in there. That people can hang in there when life gets hard. See, Jesus... He gives us the gift of resilience. It is through resilience that we learn how to be a follower of Jesus. He says this, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't say, now that you've started following me, you will never have trouble anymore. Like trouble's done. And he also doesn't say, in this world, you'll have trouble, too bad, you're on your own, figure it out. Right? He doesn't say that. What he says is, in this world, you will have trouble. That's part of being in this world. And you are not alone. And this is how God shapes us into being a follower of Jesus. It is through how we respond to the trouble that is inevitable. See, some people, they, they come there like, well, they come to me and say, well, you know, I started following Jesus and this bad thing happened. How come? You think, well, what makes you think that bad thing wouldn't have happened if you weren't following Jesus? Right? I would rather go through the bad things with Jesus than without Jesus. And as we follow Jesus, we start to change the question that we ask. Rather than, why did this happen to me? We start to be able to ask, God, how do you want me to respond? How do you want me to, to approach this trial? Because Jesus doesn't promise a problem-free life. Jesus promises that we will learn how to navigate the world in relationship with him. And, and that is what we, what, as we grow in resilience, and as we grow to say, troubles, they're going to happen but troubles, how we respond to them, that begins to shape us as people. That begins to shape our faith and our character. We can do that with our children as well. We don't need to either rescue them from trouble and think, oh, no, I don't want anything terrible to happen to you, or abandon them to say, life is hard. Good luck with that. We can help them navigate this and give them the gift of resilience. And Daniel Siegel says it's this combination of cushion and pushing. Right? And pushing is trusting that our kids could do hard things and handle hard things, and cushion is being a safe place with them. And I want to share with you an example of this that recently happened in my life. My daughter, Imogen, is seven, and so she's at the age where I have to ask her if I can tell a story about her. And I asked her permission, and she said yes. So she actually demonstrated resilience and taught me about this pushing and cushion this last week. So I was putting her to bed one night, and she was really distraught about going to school the next day. Like, I don't want to go to school. I don't like school. And I was like, this is not the normal. Like, school's boring. I don't want to do homework. Like, something, something's not right. And so I said, did something happen at school? Something bothering you? And she just burst into tears. And they have this thing called dojo points where they get to cash them in at the end of the week and 
get a prize. And so she cashed in her dojo points. And I was trying to get the story because if you're not in it, you're like, what are you talking about? I don't understand what's bothering you. And she had, she had picked out with her dojo points a bouncy ball. I wish I had brought it with me so you could see it. It's this giant bouncy ball that has a spiky eyeball in the middle. That is what she chose to get. And I was like, oh, all right. Eyeballs are gross. So she got this bouncy ball, but apparently it, she pulled it out of the 35 bin, but she thought it was probably supposed to be in the 40 bin. So she only spent 35 for it. And then like, she's got this conviction of, I, I think I might've known that it was in the wrong bin, or maybe I made a mistake. And she was just feeling terrible about it, right? Now, some parents might go like, no big deal. It's just a bouncy ball, who cares, right? But this is a moment where, okay, in this world, you will have trouble. So I talked to her about, well, it sounds like this is sometimes how it works when God convicts us of something, right? How the Holy Spirit works. And it sounds like something's really bothering you. So maybe you should talk to your teacher about this. And she was so distraught. I do not want to talk to my teacher about this. She's going to take all my dojo points away. And, and I was like, okay, we're going real extreme here. It's like, how about this? Sounds like you're really scared to talk to your teacher. What if I drive you into school tomorrow and I go with you? She says, will you talk to my teacher for me? I said, no, that's the pushing, right? Like, no, I, you can do this, but I'll be right there and beside you. So and she's like, I don't even want to, I wish I could do it right now. I don't want to sleep all night with this. Like, you know that feeling, right? I'm, I'm going to have to, like, you're dreading it. She woke up in the morning, dreading it. We drive into school and she's so nervous and we get into the classroom and she explains to her teacher, I took the, I bought this with 35, but I think it might have been supposed to be in the 40 point. And she just feels so terrible. And the teacher says, you know, I, you're right. I think maybe it got mixed up, and but thank you for being honest. And as a reward, you get to keep that for 35. No big deal, right? And they hugged, and it was so great. And Imogen had this moment where she learned, I can do hard things, and I can tell the truth even when it's hard. And she got to put the character of Jesus into practice, right? And I didn't, I didn't abandon her to say, like, go tell your teacher by yourself, but I didn't rescue her for it either, and we get to teach our kids resilience, but we have to learn resilience. And this is the same way God builds re resilience in us. You can do hard things. You're not alone. That's how we build resilience in ourselves. It's a gift that God wants to give us. The third gift, the third good gift that we all need to thrive in life is insight. And insight is this ability to know what's going on inside of yourself and then make choices from that, rather than just reacting, right, and having something happen and then you react automatically, but to actually slow down and figure out what's going on inside of me. And in Christianity, we have a fancy word for this. It's called sanctification. And all that means is to be set apart, to be made holy, to be shaped into the character of Jesus. And we say we gain insight as disciples. Because the way that we talk about discipleship here at the Meeting House is a disciple is someone who spends time with Jesus, learning from Jesus, how to be like Jesus. Spending time with Jesus, learning from Jesus, how to be like Jesus. We move from our own instincts, which are, you know, remember Jesus said, like, you've got, you're not in the best state, right? You who are sinful, there's a, a moral corruption going on there, right? We are more likely to hold grudges. We're more likely to hit back. We're more likely to, you know, be petty or like our instincts aren't always right. So we move from our own automatic instincts to putting in, into practice the teachings of Jesus. And the teachings of Jesus are hard. You know, Jesus regularly says, take the lower seat. You know, be a servant. Go the extra mile. You know, give even, even when you don't want to. Forgive even when you don't want to. Pray for your enemies. Love those who don't love you back. Invite people to your parties who can't give you anything, right? This, these are the teachings of Jesus. And they're not easy. And so it's as we learn from Jesus, it begins to change us from the inside out as we begin to reflect on our lives. And the, the best way to gain insight is this, what is called the pause, the pause and reflect. Because when we pause and we reflect, we get to ask a very important question, which is why. Not why is this happening to me, but why might I say that? Why am I doing this? Why do I want this? Why am I thinking this? And Jesus, he poses these questions, even in the same sermon where these two questions come from, these why questions to slow us down, that we can pause and actually reflect, why do you think that? Why are you doing that? Here's some of the questions he asks us. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Another question he asks, look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable? than 
birds? And you think, what? Why, do you, why, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you thinking what you're thinking? He asks this, can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Why are you so worried? What do you think worry is going to get you? And then he asks this, and, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and is tomorrow thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you you have little faith. Why are you so worried? Why are you running after the things that you're doing? Why are you living your life that way? What do you think is gonna, you're going to get from that? Who do you think God is? See, Jesus helps us understand our internal state so that it can be transformed. He invites us to pause and not just react, but to reflect and then to choose. To choose. What does it mean to live faithfully in this moment? Rather than just going by my automatic responses. Say, there's, you, get, you get to choose what you do in this moment. You get to choose what story you believe. You get to choose who you will be in this moment. And when we learn how to pause and actually reflect on why am I doing what I'm doing? Why do I think that? Why do I believe that? Why am I chasing after this thing? We can start to build that skill into our kids as well. Because when they learn how to pause and reflect, they can start to make new choices. Right? Because their instincts are even worse than yours, right? Like, if, if they get hit, they automatically hit back, right? If, they, if someone sticks their tongue at them, they stick their tongue back. Like, it's always like, but they, but they, right? And so we get to give them a different way of thinking about this. And so when they come to us, rather than just telling them what to do, right, when they come to us about their grades or about their friends or about their fears, rather than saying, well, you need to get your grade up, or you need to go say you're sorry, or you need to do this, we can start to ask them questions, to give them insight into what is going on inside of you. Well, why do you think your teacher might have responded that way? Why do you think your friend didn't want to play with you on the playground? What grade do you want to get, and why do you want to get that? Why do you think that school matters or doesn't matter? And we give them this gift of beginning to choose life rather than just walking through life in this automatic way. We get to teach them how to choose to put on the character of Jesus. And the the final gift, the fourth one that all of us need is empathy. It's empathy. And empathy is more than sympathy. See, sympathy is being able to understand the feelings of someone else, right? But you have all sorts of politicians and marketers who understand your feelings and learn how to, to manipulate them to get you to do something, That's not what we're talking about. Empathy is both understanding the feelings of someone else and being moved to take action to help them. See, in empathy, there is sacrifice. There is sacrifice. There is sacrifice in your time, in your money, in your energy, in your preferences. There's sacrifice built into empathy. And Jesus calls us to a life of empathy. Jesus says this, There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. Again, Jesus tells us, take the lowest spot. Go the extra mile. Turn the other cheek. Give even when you don't want to give. Forgive when you don't want to forgive. Jesus teaches us that a life of sacrifice is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. But you can't do that on your own. That's not our natural starting place. And the only reason we can live a life of sacrifice is because we have first received sacrificial love. See, Jesus, right before he says, no greater love is this than to lay down one's life for one's friends, he says this, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. And how has Jesus loved us? That night, after he says that word, Jesus is going to be arrested, and he's going to be uh, beaten, and he's going to be falsely accused, and the next day he's going to be nailed to a cross, And he's going to die so that he might rise again and defeat the grave and set us free. Jesus gave up everything so that we might have life. Jesus gave up his life to set us free from that that condition of being morally corrupt, of being in a bad state, of being weighed down and heavily burdened. Jesus did all of that when we couldn't give him anything to give us the ultimate gift. And it is only as we receive that sacrificial love that we can then live out of that, that we can love 
others as we have first been loved. John, who is also a follower of Jesus, says it like this. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. John also says we love because God first loved us. And I can say there's nothing more sacrificial than being a parent. Because that is when we have to forgive even when our kids are acting unforgivable. When we have to give energy when we are exhausted. When we have to teach even though we don't want to. When we have to love even when our kids aren't acting very lovable. When we have to come alongside them when they're making bad choices. And even sometimes they continue to make bad choices over and over and over again. And it causes us all sorts of pain to keep loving them. But we keep loving them. We can live sacrificially because we have been loved so deeply with a sacrificial love. And when we know that, we can live that and then teach that. Because here's the thing. Empathy is not learned through lectures. Empathy is not learned through talking. Empathy is learned through example. So both when we choose to forgive our kids, when we don't, when we don't feel like it, when we choose to love or show up even when we're tired, but also how we live a life of empathy in front of our kids. And so, again, my daughter is seven, and seven-year-olds are petty. I don't know if you know that, but they can be really petty where they hold grudges and they, they often do the, well, but she started it, and but she said, or, you know, and they don't always take responsibility, right? So we're working on forgiveness because forgiveness doesn't come very naturally to a lot of us, right? And definitely not to my daughter. And so we're working on not holding a grudge and taking responsibility for your part or forgiving even when you don't want to forgive. And so rather than just telling her, you should forgive, right? I'm working to forgive. I'm working to forgive someone in my life. And so we've talked about that, you know, that I'm called to forgive this person even if they don't ask for forgiveness and even if I don't feel like they feel sorry for what they've done or they acknowledge what they've done, I'm still called to forgive them. Why? Not because I should, not because I have to, but because I was forgiven when I didn't know to ask for forgiveness, that I was loved even when I was wrong. And so if I have been loved that way, I'm called to love that way to others, to extend that love to others. And so we can begin to give the gift of empathy to our children when we ourselves have received the love that comes from God, the love that gave up everything. And so here's the deal, parents. If you want to upgrade your family, if you want to upgrade your relationship with your kids, if you want this to be your best year ever as a parent, the best thing you can do is upgrade your relationship with God. Think about it, how much you love your kids, the good things that you want for your kids, the gifts you want to give to your kids. How much more does God want to give you good gifts? How much more does God want to pour into you, not out of his lack, but out of his abundance, and then you can pour out of your abundance? See, right before Jesus asked those two rhetorical questions, giving us this picture of you can trust God, he says this, keep on asking and you will receive what you ask for. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who seeks, finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. And there's two parts to this. Jesus says your part it, sometimes it, this verse is ask, seek, knock, but the verb there is actually this continual present action. Spend your life asking. Spend your life seeking. Spend your life knocking. Because, why? Because it's guaranteed that God is going to answer. It is guaranteed that you will receive these good gifts. It is, it's, it's, you don't have to worry about it. Just that's, if you spend your life asking and seeking and knocking for the good gifts of Jesus. It will be poured into you. And when it is poured into you, you can pour into others. And so here at the Meeting House, we want to help you do that. We actually want to help you live a life seeking and asking and knocking. And there's two opportunities I want to tell you about. 
And we run these things not just because they're great things to do and we want to, you know, get you in the building, but because we actually believe that these are helpful. That as we pour into you, you grow in asking for these gifts, and as you grow in these gifts, your kids grow. And so the first is Gracious Parenting. We run Gracious Parenting here, and starting this Thursday, we're running a seven-week morning edition of Gracious Parenting here at the Carlisle campus from 9.30 to 11. And so you can invite a friend. If you're a stay-at-home parent, that's great. If you're a parent who works and you can take the time off for that time, we'd love to have you. But invite your neighbors. This is an opportunity to get real practical around what does it look like to have practical tools that I can give my children these four gifts. And so we'd love to walk alongside you parents. That's something that we, we want to pour into you. And the other thing is we have a marriage night coming up. And we really believe that healthy marriages build healthy families, build healthy kids, build healthy neighborhoods. And so our marriage night is called Fight Night. Kind of looks like Fright Night because some of you are really scared about fighting. And we may, it's a super fun night. We have dinner. We have games. It's not embarrassing. It's just super, it's great. It's an awesome date night. But we're also going to give you some really practical tools on how to fight fair. And what does that look like to actually work through conflict together? And again, we'd invite you, bring a friend, bring a neighbor. We want to be helping parents keep growing in their relationship with God. Because as you receive the good gifts of God, pray that prayer that my friend taught me to pray. God, I want every good gift that you want to give. Have the boldness to pray that because you want your children to have every good gift that you could give them. Right? How much more does your Father in Heaven want to give you the things that will actually benefit your life, that will bring you joy, that will help you to thrive? Let us be so bold to upgrade our relationship with God because we know that it will pour out into everyone around us. Let's pray. Gracious God, we love you. Heavenly Father, thank you that we've been given this image of one that we can trust you, that we can come to you, and that we can be guaranteed that you will answer our prayer, that we, can, that we can ask and seek and knock and spend our whole life pursuing you because you desire to give us good gifts. It's not begrudging. It's not withholding. We don't have to figure out the right way to ask it or get ourselves in the right place, God. You are one who just wants to pour out onto us as your children. Help us to know how deeply loved we are by you. Give us the gift of balance and resilience and insight and empathy that we can give those gifts to all those around us as well, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that you are good and that you are holy and that you are calling us to life, life, and more life. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.